So today I have the pleasure of introducing uh, my friend Tom Hubler. Tom and I served on the board of the um, now uh, defunct uh, College of Visual Arts in St. Paul. May it rest in peace. And I don't think it was our service that caused that to happen. Um, but it is nice to see Tom again. That's right, my fellow St. Paulite as well, fellow St. Paulite. So when Tom Hubler began his family business consulting practice in 1980, he was one of only a few professionals focused on family-owned businesses in the United States. In his early career, he was a marriage and family therapist, and after receiving a Bush Fellowship in 1977, he pioneered the concept of succession planning in family-owned businesses. Tom has over 35 years of experience working with families and is respected not only for his business and planning acumen, but also for his skills as a peacemaker. In his time off, Tom tends bees, harvesting honey for family, friends, and clients. And he also told me at lunch he spends time with his grandchildren. His three-acre wood honey is noted for its mellow flavor and vibrant color. So maybe if you have questions about beekeeping, uh, he could take those as well. Another talk, all right. All right. Please join me in welcoming Tom Hubler. It's nice to be here, and I want to thank you for uh, inviting me today. And um, <clears throat> when, when Jack was uh, giving his introduction to Retha Clark, gosh, I'm King, uh, he mentioned that my daughter Kirsten went to uh, Clark Atlanta U in Atlanta. And uh, one of the things I'm the most proudest about is that she went there. And uh, if you don't know it, it's, one of, it's a predominantly black school in the country. And uh, no one there could tell that my daughter was raised in a white family. And as you would imagine, college students get together and talk about what college kids do, and they talk about white people and what they're like. And Kirsten would say, well, no, that's not true. They're not like that. Well, how do you know? Well, my folks are white. Well, and they just were you know, just surprised by that. So anyway, so it's good for me to be here. And, and uh, Andrea mentioned that I have got uh, grandkids. I have seven grandkids. And my oldest granddaughter is a freshman this year at the University of Wisconsin. And, uh, she is a very, very bright young lady and is a, has a full scholarship at the University of Wisconsin, so I'm very proud of her. So what I'm here today to do, though, is to talk more about family businesses and what family businesses are like and so forth. And the question is, why are we talking about family businesses? Well, most people don't realize that family businesses are basically the, the largest number of businesses in the country. Almost 95% of the businesses in this country are family-owned and operated. And I think it's about 160 to Fortune 500 are family-owned. And the family businesses are the backbone of our economy, and they're the, the source of most new employment. Over 60% of new employment comes out of family businesses, and over 50% of the gross national product comes out of family businesses. So that's a big, 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 big part of our economy. And so what I want to do is talk a little bit about them in terms of, of what they're all about. And the first thing to, to realize is that they're completely, you know, like a family business, if you work at General Mills or 3M or someplace like that, you can see that your family and your business system are separate, but they do have an influence on each other, and you can see that they're very, very different systems. The family system is primarily an emotion-based system. The business is more business-oriented in terms of tasks and so forth. Families operate to minimize change. Businesses have to change, so there's some conflicts that are inherent in a family-owned business. This is what I would de describe as an ideal family business, and this is why family businesses outperform the Standard & Poor's 500. They're very, very successful when they use best family business practices, and we'll be talking about that this, this afternoon. And um, <clears throat> so this is what I would call a constructive overlap, but what happens is, is sometimes the business is vulnerable to family issues and entanglements that are part of all of our families, and business differences that we erode family relationships and I had a client one time when I, one of the questions I ask when I do interviews is, you know, why was I hired? And he referred to this next slide as the big red dot. At the time it was red. But he, he basically said, I've never had the experience of going home from work. I'm always on the job. And they were in a family recreation business and would continually talk about the business. I was doing this uh, presentation uh, a number of years ago and I got to this part of the presentation and the young man raised his hand and he said, you know, those circles are equal in size. He said, if my dad were drawing those circles, his business circle would be really big, and his family circle would be very small. And then he said, now if my wife were drawing those circles, her family circle would be very big, 
and her business circle would be very small. And he was going to sit down, and someone said, well, what do your circles look like? He said, I'd rather not say. Now, he was there with his whole family, caught in the middle between two people he really loved, his dad and his wife. And the background was that two weeks prior to the seminar, the dad had called and said, I'm in business with my two sons, my older son's my heir apparent, he's an engineer. He's been terrific up until two years ago, but that's when he got married, and my daughter-in-law's the problem, and can you come and fix her? And I said, no, I don't do that sort of thing. <laughs> but he had figured out that, you know, that the, um, that the daughter-in-law was the problem, and she was the one that was causing all the problems. And what happens in family business is this is an organizational problem that people within family businesses experience as an interpersonal issue. And the way they deal with it is to blame. So, so there are two major pitfalls in terms of family-owned businesses. The first one is the avoidance of issues. And in order to do succession planning in a family-owned business, you have to talk about two of the three most difficult things to talk about in our culture. And you have to talk about money, and you have to talk about death. And nobody wants to talk about that. And then the other thing that's, that relates to this is this famous theory that's taught in all the business schools, and I'm sure it's taught over at Normandale. It's called Hubler's Speck of Dust Theory. Is it taught over there? I mean, you're unfamiliar with it? I, I, can't, I can't believe that, that you don't talk about that over there. Hubler's Speck of Dust Theory is this very famous theory that nobody has ever heard about. And the theory is that there's these little differences about how to deal with business in our family. You think, no, I better not bring that up because if I do, it's really going to upset our Thanksgiving holiday. It's an important holiday in our family. I'm going to, I'm going to let it go. Then there's another little difference. You think, no, it's the Christmas holiday. That's the most important holiday in our family. If I bring that issue up, it's really going to upset our family. I'm going to let that go. And so what happens in family businesses is people inadvertently create the very problem they're trying to avoid by not talking about their differences. So it creates all kinds of problems. And then the second major pitfall is the failure to have a plan. Family businesses love to do what they do, but to get them to plan is a big deal. It's a big issue. When I was a junior in high school, I worked for a family business over in St. Paul called Nolan's Grocery Stores. And Bill Nolan was the oldest of the boys who owned the store, and he was a survivor of World War II, had been a prisoner of war, and he always spoke in riddles. He was very jocular. And one day I was stamping three or three tins, tins of peas and putting them on the shelf, and he came down the aisle and said to me, what's your plan? I said, I don't have a plan. I'm busy putting peas on the shelf. I'm like, leave me alone. And he said to me again, what's your plan? I don't have a plan. And he said to me, a plan that isn't working is better than no plan at all. And he walked off, and I thought, well, what a dumb thing to say. But I've remembered that my whole career, and I used it when I taught over at the University of St. Thomas, I've used it always, because having a plan is critical, and you can't create one in the middle of a crisis or in the middle of a transition. So what I want to do um, is mention to you what I consider to be some of the obstacles to succession planning. And this was originally my David Letterman list of the 10 obstacles to succession planning, and it goes number 10, number 9, we'll go through it. But if you're interested, it's the most widely read article on my website. And there are about 60 articles that I've published that are on my website that you can download or read whatever you want to do. And this is one of them. So number 10 is the poor expression of feelings and wants. And when things break down in terms of communication in any family or any business or any organization, it's usually because feelings and wants are not uh, talked about. And then number nine is differences are seen as a liability rather than an asset. Uh, people you know, get negative about differences. Number eight is indirect communication. So if I'm upset with Andrea about something, I don't call Andrea. I call Mary and say, listen, Mary, what's going on with Andrea? And Mary says, well, haven't you talked with her? I said, no, you can't talk to that whatever. You know, you know what she's like. And I'm involving a third person, not talking about it directly, and that happens a lot in many of our families and certainly in family-owned businesses. And then number seven is entitlement. So when I first started doing this work 30 years ago, everybody used to say to me, I bet you meet a lot of kids who are entitled or born with a silver spoon in their mouth. Mm, that's not been the case. But guess who I do meet in family businesses who are entitled? Who do you think I meet who are entitled? Huh? Pardon me? The owners. Yes, it's the owners. They say, I, owe, I, I founded this thing. I own this thing. I'll, I'll do whatever the heck I want to do. Ba -ba 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 -ba. And sometimes they do it at the expense of their companies and their families. And then number six is scarcity. And oftentimes, uh, and this is, relates to sibling rivalry. And when there's sibling rivalry or scarcity in a family-owned business, what do, you think, what do you think they're competing about? Or what's so scarce that they don't have enough of? Pardon me? 
dad's attention. Absolutely right. You want to look for a part-time job? I think I can, <laughs> I think I can, I think I can use you. you know, because that's really it. I mean, they're looking for dad's attention. I worked for a client down in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, where they had a car dealership. And this younger son, well, the older son was the, uh, had been designated as the heir apparent, and all the papers were signed with Motors Holding Company, the financial arm of GM. But the younger son wanted to come into the business. And the reason he wanted to come into the business was to spend time with his dad, because that was the only way he was going to be able to spend time with his dad. So the way you enter the car business is to do sales, right? So he was a terrible salesman. So they thought, well, listen, we'll move him over to the service department. Well, he was even worse over there. And that's just happened to be when we were involved with them and helped the younger, you know, younger generation adult son uh, realize that he needed to go back to school and develop another career. And it was in the social sciences. And he went back to school. And we got the dad to make a commitment that he would play tennis with him once a week and go to fishing two or three times in the summertime. And that took care of his need. So before I get to the, uh, the next five, because they're, they're all listed together, I want to ask you what you think might be the, the number the number one issue on my list of obstacles to succession planning, what do you think it might be? Fairness. Fairness, that's possible. Unwillingness to, to let go. Mm, that's close. You're getting good. <laughs> I'm <about> that. <laughs> no. No. Actually, uh, you'll see here, it's, uh, well, it's not there. It's, well, I'll, I'll get to it when I get to it. So let's, the, the fifth one is history. History is a big issue in all of our families, and we tend to overlook it and ignore it. And history, even when it's um, positive, is, is sometimes hard for families to realize and to accept. There's a book that I recommend to people. It's called The Way We Never Were, which talks about how we, how we mythologize our family history. And then number four is other oriented regarding change. If things are going to get better around here, Mahendra is going to have to change, and he's my brother, and so we're going to, you know, if things are going to get better. He, he's the one that has to change, and he's responsible, blah, 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 blah. And how many of you tried to change somebody else? How is it working? doesn't work at all. It just doesn't work. And then number three is control. You know, Kirk Carlson was Minnesota's most famous entrepreneur, and the reason he was so successful is because he was in control. But that was also his Achilles heel, and that's why it took him so long and went through so many difficulties before he finally selected his daughter and she became a very successful entrepreneur in her own right. But it took him a long time to, to, to acknowledge her. And then the number two issue is the lack of forgiveness. And there's an article, again, on my website. As, it's forgiveness as an intervention in family-owned businesses. But what I've discovered is that many families don't take what they learn on the weekend, on Friday night or Saturday or Sunday, and bring it into the rest of their life. And it's impossible, as you know, to live in a family with people you love and not step on each other's toes once in a while. It happens all the time. And uh, so you need to be able to forgive each other and be able to move on. And then the number one issue from my perspective is the lack of expression of appreciation, recognition, and love. And my experience is that the senior generation desperately wants to be validated. So when you get into your 60s and 70s, people begin to wonder, whether or not what they've been doing over the course of their life has meant something. Kids love their parents, but they take them for granted, and they don't say, listen, Mom and Dad, we love everything you've done for us, and blah, 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 blah. And of course, that's what the kids are looking for also. And I've got a film clip that will we'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute. So that's my number 10. Yes? Um, is that the list in order of frequency or impact? No, no, no. But I think, you know, it's... Uh, because like feelings and wants, that's the, you know, communication is a big issue in, in many families and certainly in family-owned businesses. So that would be if, you know, close to the top of the list. So, and, and then the lack of expression of, of uh, appreciation, recognition, and so forth, that's also right at the top of the list along with forgiveness, that type of thing. So, so what I want to do now is quickly go through legacy because this whole issue of succession planning is a part of your legacy. And so when I first started doing this presentation, I started doing some research on legacy and I went to Webster's and came up with the Webster's definition of money or property left by a will or anything handed down by an ancestor. And that's, I thought, well, that's not very good. So I went a little further and I discovered a woman named Laura Nash who used to teach at Harvard who wrote an article in the Harvard Business Review called Just Enough and, excuse me, Success at Last. And she and a guy named Howard Stevenson wrote a book, um, Just Enough. But anyway, what she says essentially is that, that life needs to be put in those four buckets of happiness, achievement, significance, and legacy. And when she was talking about legacy, she basically said, you don't have to wait until you're 65 to start thinking about your legacy. It's something you could be doing right now. 
And what she defines, like I say, as your gift of the future to help others find success. And the other part of legacy that I think is important is uh, my part of it, or my definition of it, has to do with how you're going to be remembered. So it's those two things. And that's what I think motivates entrepreneurs to do the kind of planning that we're talking about, along with some other things. <clears throat> uh, Allianz, which is a German insurance company that has its US headquarters here in Minneapolis, did a study in 2005. And basically, the, uh, the, the bottom line is that the non-financial items that parents leave behind, like ethics, morals, faith, religion, are 10 times, 10 times more important than the financial aspects of legacy. Yet for the most part, we sp most people work with their financial advisors and spend all of their time and energy and money on the financial part of it rather than the, what I would try to describe as the emotional family part of it, the values part of it. And uh, so this is my legacy model. You can see it's a pie chart and it has uh, five parts to it. And um, the first part is the, what I call wealth preservation planning. And this is the thing you do with your accountant, your attorney, and your insurance and financial planner type people who help you preserve your wealth. But the rest of it is what I would describe, except for the business part, are, are what I would describe as wealth preparation planning, helping prepare the younger generation adult children for the responsibilities of, of stewardship and the money that you're gonna be passing along to them. So it includes heritage and family values and family stories, which are you know, important to capture before uh, people get too old. Uh, this issue of, of community service and philanthropy, there's an attorney in um, North Carolina who wrote a book called The Congruent Life, who said that um, community or service is on the outside like prayer is on the inside. Service is on the outside like prayer is on the inside. And the antidote to consumption, and our kids get 3,000 messages a day to spend, the antidote to consumption is service and philanthropy. And again, if we had more time, we could talk about that. Um, and then uh, life meaning and the things that are important to you are all, again, important to be uh, captured. And then the last thing is, is the succession planning, which is the other part of, again, why we're here today is to talk about succession planning. And there are four parts to the ownership of the, the succession planning model. And this is called Inside Out Succession Planning. And there are articles on my website called Inside Out Succession Planning, part one and two. But it starts with your core purpose. And then the blue area is what motivates owner entrepreneurs to do the kind of planning we're talking about. It's economic security, health, family unity. Nobody wants to be in their 60s and 70s and have business differences screw up their family. And then lastly is legacy as I've just defined it. And then the four plans are an ownership plan. You can see here the priorities of ownership planning are deciding if you're gonna have another generation of your adult children in the business and then the economic security of the parents, the equitable treatment of the children. And if we had time, there's multiple stories to talk about how families get into arguing about money. Minimization of its t state taxes. It's not a tax-driven program, but that's the fourth priority. And then having a family awareness program in terms of, of notifying the family and letting them know what's going on before the papers are finalized. And lastly is uh, what I would call uh, having an active board of directors. Every company has a board of directors legally, but activating it and making it a, a positive thing is something that's really important. Um, and again, in terms of best family business practices and the research on family businesses, this is the thing that makes all the difference in the world in terms of uh, their success. And then having a, uh, a management and leadership plan about who's gonna do what and making it clear, having what I call a family participation plan, which would encompass some of these things, uh, to have a, a set of ground rules to know what you're supposed to do and when you're supposed to do it, uh, and then having a business plan. Every, plan. every business, every company has a business plan. Usually if it's an entrepreneurial business, in the back of the head, but there needs to be, when you've got multiple owners to a business, you definitely need to have a business plan. And then lastly, a family plan about how you're gonna be a family without the undue influence of the business and be able to build the emotional equity of your family while you're building the equity of your company. That fellow's name is Michele Csikszentmihalyi. And he used to teach at the University of Chicago and he wrote a book, he wrote multiple books. But uh, he studies what's called the autotelli personality. And what he says here is that now that the matter of the family has become a matter of, of choice, it cannot survive without the uh, infusion of, of psychic energy. So the idea is that you have to build the emotional equity of your family while you're building the equity of your company. So these are some examples of common visions. And again, if you're interested in this, 
Uh, I'd be glad to give you a copy of this. Just give me your card and I'll mail you or email you a copy of the presentation. But these are, are some of the things that my clients do in terms of uh, promoting their family visions. So recommendations are it's important, I think, to have a common vision in your family. It's important to have family meetings. The purpose of family meetings is to deal with the overlap between the family and the business system. There needs to be three types of meetings in a family-owned business. There needs to be shareholder and owner meetings. There needs to be uh, employee meetings. Only people who are employees get to go to those. And then the last type of meeting are called family meetings and they deal with the overlap between the two systems. Uh, communication and the collaborative team skills is a, a, an important model to help build communication. I say even the New York Yankees go to spring training every year to brush up on the fundamentals. And then having a succession plan, and then the way you, the way you create balance between the family and the business system is to, create, is to have structure and formality. And clients say to me, Tom, we don't need all that structure and formality because we love each other. And I say it's because you love each other that you need structure and formality. So with that, uh, we've got maybe a minute or two for a, a couple of questions. Yes, Don. What do you advise clients whose children do not want to follow in the succession? Well, basically they can do an ESOP or they can sell the business outright. I mean, basically. And, uh, you know, like I only see clients who want to keep their businesses is basically it. So, but you, you can sell them, or, you know, as you know, obviously, or you can do an ESOP which is an employee stock ownership plan. Other questions? Yes? Just a comment. Um, my husband is a cardiologist and took care of Kurt Carlson. Oh, yeah? And somehow we learned that Kurt really wanted Marilyn to be a boy. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. Isn't that too bad? <laughs> <laughs> That's too bad. <laughs> Andrea, did you have a question? <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Obviously not all businesses are owned by men. No. But increasingly there are women-owned businesses yes. in like 10 seconds or less. Yeah, basically, Can you comment on the differences that you've observed? There are a lot of similarities. I mean, I think women, you know, my experience with the women owners of family businesses, and I don't have as, as many experiences with women, but they're more sensitive to some of these things, but they also get caught in the same kinds of traps and do some of the same sorts of things. And they can be, in quotation marks, as driven as their male counterparts when they get rolling sometimes. But I think, generally speaking, they're more sensitive and, and more, um, they've got a uh, more experience, I think, talking about the, the emotional relationship stuff that you need to talk about in any kind of family business if you're gonna be successful. Thank you so much, Tom.